America knew him as the lovable Uncle Milty, but behind the scenes, Milton Berle was a truly twisted man. His darkest secrets came to light in 1999 when his son William released a tell-all memoir. Berle never spoke to his son again after the book's publication, but his reputation was still shattered, especially because of William Berle's most disturbing childhood memory. But more on that later. Many believe Milton Berle is responsible for making television what it is today. Did you know that Berle's Texaco Star Theater was so immensely popular that it effectively doubled the number of televisions in American households? This success propelled Berle into superstardom, but just like most stories of rising fame, this was accompanied by the pitfalls of divorces, womanizing ways, and flaunting of his notably large ego. Speaking of which, Milton's ego was not the only large thing known about him. Stick around for some colossal insights into Milton Berle. Born as Mendel Berlinger in 1908, he grew up in Harlem with absolutely no ties to the entertainment industry. His parents not even the slightest interested in show business, with his father selling paint and his mother working as a store detective. But as fate would have it, Burl's initiation into show business happened just at the tender age of five when he entered a kid's division in Charlie Chaplin's lookalike contest and walked away with a trophy, a tin cup. This was a modest success, but big enough for it to lead to him to become a child model for Buster Brown shoes. Seeing his potential, his pushy stage mother, Sarah, campaigned for her little rising star, which paid off when he landed a role in a silent picture. His first motion picture, The Perils of Pauline, cast a young Burl to play a little boy, a role that didn't faze him at all. He knew he was born to be on the silver screen and was ready to prove himself. It did intimidate Burl when he discovered the perilous stunt he had to perform. In the pivotal scene, the director informed him that Pauline would save him, but only after he fell from a moving train. You heard that right. But Burl's apprehensions about the dangerous stunt turned out to be unfounded as he learned the intricacies of movie making, the existence of a stunt double. He then got to meet the person slated to perform the risky fall. The director simply pointed to a bag of rags on the floor. That, my friends, is movie magic. Now with the urging of his mother, Burl transitioned from one silent film to another, eventually enrolling in the Professional Children's School, a preparatory institution for entertainers. Armed with the knowledge acquired from his performing school, he found his niche in vaudeville. And by 16 years old, he was already assuming the role of the master of ceremonies. During Burl's youth, his idol was Al Jolson, dubbed as the world's greatest entertainer, and stood as an unparalleled figure. As someone he looked up to, one of young Milton's talents was that he had mastered an impressive impression of Jolson, and this proves to be of great value. His mother was keen on showcasing his talent to the world, and he will get noticed one way or another, so she devised a plan. Instead of merely being spectators at a Jolson performance, she took the initiative. In the midst of the show, she propelled 12-year-old Burl onto the stage beside Jolson and orchestrated an impromptu performance. Fortunately, Jolson took it in good humor, and the audience embraced the spontaneous act. You gotta give it to her, she is determined to make her son shine. Despite being a mere child, Milton Berle was on the trajectory towards stardom. He just needed to make one final change that seemed to be holding him back. Still being Mendel Berlinger at this point, he was quite unhappy with his real name. Whether it's for reinventing himself, his image, or whatnot, Berlinger changed it to the more show business friendly moniker, Milton Berle. Burl's father's limited provision prompted his mother to recognize in young Milton being a potential meal ticket for the family. And so, Sarah Berlinger adopted his son's fake name, became Sarah Burl, and left her husband behind with the other children, taking young Milton on the road from one vaudeville show to another. However, Sarah went way beyond merely promoting her son. She still had old tricks up her sleeves to ensure his stardom. Burl soon found himself on Broadway and Floridora, contributing to a dance number in perfect harmony with the other boys. However, his mother, always one for audacious ideas, instructed Burl to deliberately keep one of his feet out of step with the other kids on stage. A bold gamble that could result either gaining their most desired attention or being reprimanded or worse, fired. But rather than eliciting anger from the producers, this tactic worked phenomenally when it sent the audience into fits of laughter leading to a request for him to repeat the act every night. Milton Berle, through his ability to make people laugh, garnered the rewarding applause, setting the stage for a career that would continue unabated from that day onward. Growing up amidst vaudeville performers provided a markedly unconventional upbringing for the preteen. 
while his mother served as a protective presence, the vaudevillians proved to be a rugged bunch. Burl's coming-of-age experiences weren't typical, and they were notably scandalous. He even claims to have lost his innocence at the tender age of 12, no less with a chorus girl. But that didn't stop him from pursuing his dreams and he made the most out of his experience there. And indeed, it was in vaudeville, coupled with his determined mother, that steered Burl toward his true calling, stand-up comedy. With this milieu, Burl truly excelled, gracing nightclubs and bars with a readiness to do anything for laughter and applause. While audiences knew him for his comedic brilliance, his fellow comedians recognized him for something more sinister. As Burl amassed more and more laughs and presumably raking in the coin, his fellow comedians began to observe something in his acts. Some of his gags seemed oddly familiar, leading to the realization that Burl was blatantly taking and appropriating jokes and comic gags from other comedians, like nobody would ever notice. Even as Burl openly admitted to borrowing jokes from his peers, but this acknowledgement did little to dissuade the distaste in their mouths. Once, newspaper columnist Walter Winchell reported on this infringement by dubbing him the thief of bad gags. But Burl won't let this hinder his way to the top. Far from disputing it, he embraced the mockery and once quipped, I laughed so hard I nearly dropped my pencil, after witnessing a rival comedian's act. He definitely had no filter and does not discriminate who he pokes fun of, and this will ultimately land him in trouble. During one performance, Burl's routine led to a serious altercation. Engaging in crowd work as a comedian, he would tease an audience member he picked out from the crowd. But that night, Burl unknowingly targeted the last person he should have, a notorious gangster. And what followed after was Burl receiving eight stitches as a gangster attacked him with a fork not once, but twice. Between joke appropriation and encounters with gangsters, Burl found time for other dubious pursuits. He claimed to have had an affair with an aspiring actress, referred to only by the pseudonym Linda Smith. Sometime later, while pursuing a newspaper, Burl was reportedly taken aback. Smith was pictured holding a baby. Burl assumed the child was his own, but never took the initiative to confirm it or even reach out. But Burl eventually decided to settle down, and just in the 1940s, he tied the knot twice, and get this, to the same girl. It was 1941 when he first married Joyce Matthews, a showgirl. You might be thinking, a marriage between a comic and a showgirl sounds like a match made in heaven. Both are known performers in their own right. But when Matthews cited cruelty in the marriage, the two divorced in 1947. So it was questionable when only two years later, Burl once again walked down the aisle with the same woman. Maybe they really did hope to give it another shot and fight for what they had, but it seemed the second attempt wasn't worth it at all as all they ever seemed to do was just fight. So as expected, they re-divorced in 1950. Burl claims that between his two marriages to Matthews, he kept quite busy as a self-proclaimed ladies' man. One notable individual he alleges kept him occupied was Marilyn Monroe. Although a few years later, Burl co-starred with Monroe in the 1960s Let's Make Love. Burl supposedly tried to reignite the flame, but Monroe claimed she had absolutely no recollection of being with Burl ever. But Burl, not being one to shy away from tall tales, I won't be surprised if that's all that was. Another figure he supposedly had relations with was Amy Semple McPherson, also known as Sister Amy, a Canadian Pentecostal evangelist with an affinity for Hollywood. After purportedly orchestrating her own kidnapping, a flurry of accusations emerged, including an alleged affair with Burl. While Burl himself was the source of this rumor, Sister Amy vehemently refuted the claim. See what I mean? Although a not-so-hidden fact that supposedly made him famous with the ladies were the whispers about his substantial endowment. So much so that he was once challenged by a stranger to a size comparison bet, where a friend of Burl's humorously remarked, Go on, Milton, just take out enough to win. The notion was that seeing was believing. If there was one thing Burl could not rumor his way in, it was a successful radio career. Despite Burl's earnest attempts to establish himself on radio, success eluded him. It sure wasn't due to his being too visually striking for radio, it was quite the opposite. The crux lay in his slapstick gestures and facial contortions, elements which are invisible on radio, which set him apart as a stand-up comedian. Audiences needed not just hear him, but to see Burl, otherwise his formula that he was known for just didn't work. Luckily, in the late 1940s, when television was still in its infancy, this became a way for him to showcase himself to a much bigger audience. Although many Americans didn't own a set, 
Burrell's fortunes took a turn when he began hosting the Texaco Star Theater Variety Show in 1948. Suddenly, there was a huge surge in Americans wanting to own a TV, and that same year marked a milestone in the American TV ownership. One million homes suddenly had them, effectively doubling the figure. The evidence strongly suggests that Burrell definitely played a significant role in this shift. Not only did Burl's Texaco Star Theater boost TV ownership, but it also made planning activities for a Tuesday night nearly impossible. In an era predating recording devices and streaming services, if you weren't home on a Tuesday at 8 p.m. to watch Milton Burl, you missed it entirely. There were no reruns. Burl's popularity was staggering with an astounding 97% Nielsen rating for his show. This level of viewer loyalty led businesses, including theaters and restaurants, to take drastic measures. They closed their doors during Burl's show. Can you imagine? Yet, even as Burl became one of the most renowned figures in the nation, he remained unafraid to push boundaries. His ventures into cross-dressing, where he adorned women's clothing for comedic effect, highlighted once more why radio wasn't his ideal medium, and the audience absolutely loved it. However, drag performances in the 1950s were not without legal challenges. Did you know that dressing as the opposite gender was against the law back then? But clever as ever, Burl managed to circumvent this by making it explicitly clear that he was not gay, aligning with the subtext of the anti-drag law. But this was not the only outdated law Burl found himself contending with. Burl had the intention of featuring the tap dancing ensemble, the Four Step Brothers, on his show. The predicament arose when Texaco expressed reluctance to include the brothers for a disheartening reason, their race. However, this time, Burl took a stand. He proceeded to book the quartet and waited to see how Texaco would react. Despite earning the moniker Mr. Television and all the Americans rallying behind him and his show, how could Burl genuinely defy the oil giant Texaco? Well, with the show set to begin in 10 minutes, Texaco had yet to approve the all-black dance troupe, the Four Step Brothers. Burl insisted that they would perform, but Texaco remained unyielding. Just moments before the show commenced, Burl played his ace and issued his now famous ultimatum, if they don't go on, I don't go on. Faced with the prospect of no show without Burl last minute, with no backups, Texaco relented, and the Four Step Brothers not only performed but also shattered the caller line policy. One thing is for sure, Burl had a cunning method for ensuring all his jokes elicited uproarious laughter, and it's not his well-curated jokes, facial expressions, and drag. During live tapings of the Texaco Star Theater, observant audience members noticed a distinctive laugh. Some described it as piercing, others as roof-shaking. Regardless, it had the effect of enveloping the entire audience. The surprising truth behind the laughter was that it emanated from none other than Burl's mother, Sarah. Although it was not really all that surprising, Sarah Burl's influence extended beyond bringing laughter to her son's shows. She began exerting a darker influence on his personal life. Not only did she meddle in Burl's onstage performances, but she also seemed to wield a significant influence over his romantic entanglements. In fact, Burl held her responsible for his two divorces from Matthews. But despite this, he summoned the courage to marry again, this time to publicist and actor Ruth Cosgrove. Not wanting her to ruin his marriage this time around, Burl reportedly coped with his meddlesome mother by relying on a special remedy, a tranquilizer called Meltdown, and it became a frequent choice for Burl. Such was his advocacy for the drug, driven largely by his popularity, that by 1956, one in 20 Americans was reportedly using it. Burl's promotion of Milltown even earned him another nickname, Uncle Milltown. By the mid-1950s, Burl's television show began experiencing a decline in popularity. Critic W.J. Weatherby asserted that Burl's jokes were losing their efficacy and suggested that he was trying way too hard, with viewers no longer responding as enthusiastically. The audience was evolving, seeking subtler comedy. In other words, his same tired antics was not funny anymore. Burl reacted strongly to this critique and confronted Weatherby directly, but that would not stop what was happening in real time. Cracks began to appear in Mr. Television's armor, leading to a downward trajectory. In 1956, Burl's variety show underwent two name changes and a sponsor change, signaling its perceived conclusion. However, CBS Arrival Network hastened the end by scheduling a show featuring Burl's friend and regular co-performer, Phil Silvers. This move marked the conclusion of the Milton Burl show at the end of the 1955-56 season, 
ostensibly offering an opportunity for a fresh start, but that fresh start went nowhere. Despite a series of mediocre guest appearances, Burl received a significant invitation to appear on Saturday Night Live. At 71 years old, he represented a bridge between the old school vaudeville inspired comedy and the new hip humor of the 1970s. However, the experience did not go well. Burl failed to comprehend his role as more of a guest than a dictator on SNL, clashing with the producer Lorne Michaels in displaying condescension, and that's to put it lightly. Saturday Night Live was ushering in a new, more contemporary form of humor. However, when Burl took the stage for his opening monologue, he transported the audience back in time. His jokes, rooted in a different era, poked fun at the Puerto Ricans, homosexuals, and even commented on Dolly Parton's physique. He was stuck in the past and was not even remotely funny. The climax of his monologue, though, resulted in a lifetime suspension. Burl concluded his SNL monologue with a heartfelt speech recounting his show business career. What made it worse was Burl's premeditated tactic of filling the audience with his supporters. As Burl concluded his speech, his planet supporters rose for a sincere standing ovation. The unsuspecting members of the SNL audience, not part of the scheme, awkwardly remained seated. To say Lorne Michaels was unamused would be a significant understatement. Following Burl's calamitous appearance on SNL, producer Lorne Michaels barred him from ever hosting again. Michaels also prevented NBC from airing Burl's episode, deeming it detrimental to the show's reputation. While Burl amassed numerous accolades throughout his career, this was one distinction he would prefer to avoid, being remembered by Michaels as one of SNL's worst hosts, which already was a bar not set high. Ouch. It only went downhill from there. He never became a part of anything significantly big and was just in minor guest roles and appearances. One memorable moment showcased Milton Burl's aversion to letting others steal his spotlight, which was evident when tasked with presenting an award. At the 1982 Emmys, Burl handed out trophies to the writers of the sketch comedy show, SCTV. But instead of concluding his duties, a seemingly cranky Burl decided to interrupt the acceptance speech of SCTV writer and actor Joe Flaherty in a very Kanye West vs. Taylor Swift at the VMAs kind of way. Eventually, Flaherty urged Uncle Milty to go to sleep. In 1985, at the age of 77, Burl underwent quadruple bypass heart surgery. Surprisingly, the surgery seemed to invigorate his career, temporarily at least. Following the operation, he performed in Atlantic City and Las Vegas, and in 1988 starred in a made-for-TV movie titled Side by Side, alongside comedy legend Sid Caesar. Unsurprisingly, the comedic movie centered around old individuals revitalizing their careers. But pretty soon, Burl gets reminded once more that the show business landscape had changed, and just like that, the Uncle Milton train comes to a halt. Tragically, not long after, Burl's second wife Ruth Cosgrove passed away in 1989. During the same year, Burl candidly discussed his mother's negative impact on his love life, revealing that she disapproved that he dated a woman more than about three times. But now, free from her clasps, Burl didn't hesitate to tie the knot again, this time with Lorna Adams, who was 30 years his junior. But even though Burl married someone younger, fitting in with a younger generation still wasn't his strong suit. At the 1993 MTV Video Music Awards, Burl appeared alongside drag queen extraordinaire RuPaul. When Burl commented about having worn dresses too, RuPaul dryly remarked that while Burl had worn dresses, he was now in diapers. Burl's response to RuPaul's insult was far from graceful. He proceeded to grope RuPaul's chest and then used pronouns in a wild manner, referring to RuPaul as a she-he. As they prepared to exit the stage, Burl attempted to grab RuPaul's elbow for a joint departure, but RuPaul firmly swiped her elbow away. He just couldn't seem to flow well with the ever-changing times and quite frankly, it is hard to stomach half the things he got away with back in the day, passing it off as a joke in someone's expense. Well, the day of reckoning came for Burl in 1999 when his adopted son penned a tell-all memoir. Within its pages, William Burl detailed a lengthy list of grievances, primarily centered around his father's lack of involvement in his life. One specific story, however, was particularly disturbing. William disclosed that his father has funded his first intimate experience with a woman, demonstrating quite possibly the only interest he ever showed in his son's life. William did not hold back in expressing his displeasure with his father in the memoir, going so far as to poke fun at him as he aged, labeling him a pathetic has-been, describing the layers of makeup Burl used to conceal his aging appearance. And believe me, that was not even the problematic makeup he has worn. It was his blackface. On top of his opportunistic kiss and tell with various women, he was also apparently a petty tyrant who hid his loads of illegitimate children. Burl's response to this memoir was resolute. He vowed never to speak to his son again for the rest of his life, which, as it turned out, wouldn't be much longer. In 2001, Burl made a somber announcement revealing the doctors had discovered a malignant tumor in his colon. 
Bro refused surgery when his wife was adamant that it wouldn't impact his life for another 10 to 12 years. Boy, was she not a doctor and also very wrong, and that prognosis proved to be inaccurate. Unfortunately, but unsurprisingly, not even one year after the colon cancer announcement, Burl passed away in Los Angeles. Contrary to his wishes of being laid to rest alongside his second wife Ruth Cosgrove, his current wife Adams stepped in again and insisted on the burial taking place at Hillside Cemetery instead. But in a surprising turn of events, it was his estranged son William who contested the Hillside burial, citing and humorously echoing one of Burl's typical one-liners, it was too close to the airport. Milton Burl's final resting place is at Hillcrest Memorial Park, conveniently located just 8 minutes from LAX. Thus, Milton Burl's final curtain call unfolded, leaving behind a storied career, a family dynamic marked by tension, and the echoes of laughter that once resonated through the eras he traversed. In this day and age, this serves a grim reminder of the past and the people we idolize are more complicated under the surface. Milton Burl was exactly that. If you want to uncover more of old Hollywood's personas, hit that like button and make sure you subscribe to the channel.